collect the money, spend the money, and to feed you. And you're going to get to see me go toe to toe with Peter Thiel, uh, one of the great, great investors uh, and thinkers in the technology and finance space. You're going to love it. Get a paper and pen out. There's a lot of knowledge in this episode. How far, in your estimation, as an insider, do you think we are from strong AI? Is it something we're going to see in our lifetimes? I mean, this self-driving car, we keep talking about it's two or three years away for the last two or three years. feels like 10 years away, maybe. Where do you think we are with AI and, and even backing into the self-driving car? I'm curious. You know, I, I don't... Um, I'm going to disagree with the premise behind that question. I think the premise behind the question is that there's this future that's out there of, and there are these things that will happen in the future. It's sort of like the Ray Kurzweil, the singularity is near, and we have these exponential curves that are just happening, and all that you know, we should be doing is eating popcorn and watching the movie of the future unfold. Right. And I think, um, you know, I think it's, too hard, it's hard to know what's, what's going to happen, but it's, it's the wrong question because I don't think the future is fixed. And I think what matters is a question of agency. And so if we decide to work on it, you know, I think we could build it. If we don't work on it, you know, it will never get built. It's going to so get fun. built. It's going to get built. I mean, if, Larry didn't buy it. They shut it down. If everybody thinks it's going to get built, then nobody will feel like they need to do it, and then nobody will build it, and it won't get built. Okay. I feel like I'm playing chess against Kasparov. But, no, but it's, it's, no, look, it's, 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 always, it's always an agency question. And, okay, you know, but and he, so, hold on a second. And we, should, we, should not, we, we shouldn't think of the future as this thing that's out there. It's the yes. question that one should ask, especially as an entrepreneur, early founders, what is the future you want to build? Right. And then, and then that's a future you should try to work to make happen. What if the person who builds that future, however, maybe doesn't have the same um, regard for humanity or trying things, or what if they're just a little cavalier or immature? What if the person who decides, I'm going to try strong AI is a group of Pakistani students who get flipped and start working for ISIS or something like that? It sounds crazy, I know, but so did 9-11. I mean, it, this technology is not going to be reserved just for Stanford grads. What if it, it gets co-opted and people start to realize, hmm, cyber terrorism is step one, and maybe some strong AI to disrupt the world is another? Um. Well, look, I, I'm not a technological utopian. I don't think technology automatically makes the world a better place. I think there has been a you know, powerful negative story about the world, at least since Hiroshima 1945. Maybe you can go back even, even further. But I think, I think one of the reasons our culture at large is so anti-technological, and you know, the easy way to see that our culture is anti-technological is you just watch all the science fiction films, and they're all about technology that kills people, that doesn't work, that's dystopian, and the future is some combination of Matrix, Terminator, Avatar, Elysium. You know, I watched the Gravity movie uh, a year or so ago. You never want to go into outer space. You want to be back on some muddy tropical island somewhere. And that's, and I think there are, you know, I don't like this pessimism about technology, but I think I respect that there are reasons that people yeah. have it, and I think they go back to you know, all the problems of the nuclear age. So I think uh, it's part and parcel of that. I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful that the, the really crazy people are too incompetent to do things, but right. it's not absolute. Yeah, they, the crazy people have their moments, but you're generally right. The criminals tend to get caught because they're stupid. Um, but it's you, not absolute. But it's not absolute. We can't put that on the absolute Founders Fund uh, list. Um, what about jobs, efficiency, robotics? This is a very interesting area as well. And I, I, working less or working what you want to work on could be seen as a positive, right? So having to have less jobs and having more pursuits in a Star Trek kind of way to evoke a more positive and less dystopian, more utopian uh, worldview, it seemed like everybody there was pretty happy with the fact that they didn't have a job, they had a vocation or a hobby. Is that where we're going to head as a society now? I mean, automation is getting pretty severe and it's happening at a rapid or clip. There's less people working at the Tesla factory, self-driving cars, etc. cetera. Um, and we already have large unemployment in a lot of places in the world. As the world goes flat and there's less employment, what's the world going to look like? What do you think are the positives to that, the positive solutions to that? Well, um, let's see. I, I do think people have been too worried about technology replacing 
jobs for a long time. I mean, you had the Luddites in the 19th century where you were worried that, you know, there'd be nobody left to, to work in textile factories and to try to break the machinery. And it turned out that a lot of the automation and productivity gains freed people up to do other, you know, more, more productive sorts of things. So I think, you know, if we had enormous productivity gains, um, enormous GDP growth, um, it might not be perfectly um, evenly distributed, but if you had GDP grow by 4% a year, I think just about everybody would, would get better off. I think the, the challenge is actually that in most sectors, we're not having anywhere near those kinds of productivity gains. And so, you know, automation, there's been a lot of automation in manufacturing, but um, you have to keep in mind that that's a smaller and smaller part of the economy. So even if we're improving manufacturing at the same rate as we were improving it 100 years ago, let's say we're increasing efficiencies 10% a year, um, that makes less of a difference if manufacturing's, you know, 15% of GDP versus, say, 50% of GDP, as it might have been something like 100 years ago. And, um, and what our economy is more dominated by today are service sector jobs, which actually have not changed that much. So people working in restaurants, people working as kindergarten teachers, people working as nurses or um, medical technicians. Um, and, um, and this is actually why I think there's, there's less economic growth than we think, because um, we've not actually figured out ways to really increase productivity in so many other sectors. So um, in general, people, people always frame uh, the worry about technology, it's happening too quickly, it's too sure. disruptive, it's too dangerous. And what I worry about is much more the specter of stagnation, things are not changing quickly enough, we don't have enough growth, and then when you don't have enough growth, that's where I think you have real challenges. You know, in a world without growth, everything becomes a zero-sum game. I'll only get ahead by you falling further behind, and that, that becomes a much nastier world. When you look at the various sectors you're investing in, which one do you think has the most potential you know, in the coming years? Healthcare, robotics, AI? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always skeptical of, of sectors um, and trends. People always ask me, you know, what are some trends that I see happening in the future? And um, I never like the question because, again, it's like I'm not a prophet. I don't think the future sure. is, is fixed in that sort of way. But I also think, at this point, I think all trends are overrated. And, and so, um, you know, um, healthcare IT, education software, somewhat overrated. SaaS uh, software, pretty badly overrated. If you hear the words big data, cloud computing, you need to run away as fast as you possibly can. You need to just think fraud and run away. Yeah. And, and, and the reason you want to be really careful about these buzzwords, so if I said, you know, I'm doing a, a mo building a mobile platform for SaaS enterprises to uh, do big data in the cloud. And if you have sort of like a proliferation of buzzwords. Um, Can you it, introduce me to that company? Um, I, I know, I know you, you, you'll invest without asking any questions. So, uh, <laughs> if you're investing, yes. <laughs> I'll have them call you collect. But, um, but, the, but, the, uh, but the, 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 these, all these buzzwords, yeah. they're a tell, like in poker, that the company's bluffing and that it's undifferentiated because we've heard the buzzwords before. And so if you're the nth company in a category that's well-established, that's problematic. You don't want to be the fourth online pet food company or the, uh, you know, or the 10th thin film solar panel company or the 1,000th restaurant in San Francisco. So it's harder to describe because there's no buzzword. That's good. Yes. So I would say, yeah. So I think the things that are, you know, conversely, the things that are underrated are the ones where there are no buzzwords, where it's, it's sort of, it doesn't actually fit into any pre-existing categories. And then you have to always be open to listening to those. And of course, the challenge is that very often, I think, even the people who are running these companies will describe them in terms of existing categories because that's so much easier to do. So Google would have been described as a search engine in 1998. People have said, why do we need another search engine? We already have 20 in that category. And what was the first machine-powered search? And the PageRank algorithm was actually the key differentiating thing. And if you simply labeled it as a search engine, that would have obscured um, all the key differences. Or if you described Facebook as a social network circa 2004, even circa 2015, that's a misleading categorization. There have been many social networks before Facebook. Uh, Reid Hoffman, my friend who started LinkedIn, started a company called SocialNet back in 1997. They already had social networking in the name of the company. And it was sort of these avatars in cyberspace, and you'd be a cat and I'd be a dog, and we'd have these weird interactions on the internet. And, um, and it turned so out- no different than last week when- yeah. and, and it turned out, yeah, people, people aren't interested in networking 
in the abstract. Right. They're interested in real identity. Right. And real identity was the key innovation that Facebook had. It was the first one to crack real identity. So I think often um, um, figuring out the, the correct way to think about things in categories for which we don't even have the, the proper languages is really critical to do.